and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Talking Book, Introducing Early Africana Writing in English. Sometimes you don't know whether to laugh or cry. You're in that middle ground between comedy and tragedy, the realm of the tragic comic. It's not an effect that is easy to pull off in a book or movie, to pull on the heartstrings even while tickling the funny bone. And among books, about the last place you'd expect to find tragic comedy is in a slave narrative. Such narratives, autobiographical accounts of the experience of slavery, came to play a very important role in the fight for the abolition of slavery, and thus often had an explicitly political purpose. Given that purpose and their horrific subject matter, these stories are far more apt to provoke tears than laughter. Yet there is a legitimately tragic comic moment in the 1772 book that has some claim to be the very first slave narrative, a claim that warrants its self-confident title, a narrative of the most remarkable particulars in the life of James Albert Ukausa Gronioso, an African prince as related by himself. Gronioza's narrative was not so clearly intended as a piece of political activism. A preface to the work by a man named Walter Shirley tells us that a young woman in Leominster, England, whose name we are not given, took down Gronioza's words for her own private satisfaction. The decision to publish was made first and foremost as a way of providing relief to Gronioza and his family given their poverty. Nevertheless, the narrative is pioneering in its first-hand account of Gronioza's birth into royalty somewhere in or near what is now northern Nigeria, the journey away from home that ended in him being sold to the captain of a Dutch slave ship, and his various life experiences after that fateful moment. It is as he describes his voyage across the Atlantic that we get the tragic comic story of Gronioza's first encounter with books. Speaking about the Dutch captain who bought him, Gronioza relates... He used to read prayers in public to the ship's crew every Sabbath day, and when first I saw him read, I was never so surprised in my whole life as when I saw the book talk to my master, for I thought it did, as I observed him to look upon it and move his lips. I wished it would do so to me. As soon as my master had done reading, I followed him to the place where he put the book, being mightily delighted with it, and when nobody saw me, I opened it and put my ear down close upon it in great hope that it would say something to me. An amusing scene at first, but tragedy is close at hand, as Groniosa adds, I was very sorry and greatly disappointed when I found it would not speak. This thought immediately presented itself to me that everybody and everything despised me because I was black. Henry Louis Gates Jr. writes about this moment in Groniosa's text in his classic 1988 book, The Signifying Monkey, a theory of Afro-American literary criticism. As Gates points out, Gronioza was only the first of a number of black authors of the 18th century to describe a first encounter with books marked by misunderstanding. We find such a scene in a book published in 1785 called A Narrative of the Lord's Wonderful Dealings with John Marant, a Black, although in Marant's autobiography, it is not he but rather a Cherokee princess that tries in vain to listen to his Bible while stopping her father, the king, from taking Marin's life. Then there is Kwabina Otoba Kuguano, whom we first introduced in episode 29. Kuguano discusses both Gronioza's and Marin's narratives in his Thoughts and Sentiments on the Evil and Wicked Traffic of the Slavery and Commerce of the Human Species, published in 1787. He, too, in a seemingly unrelated section, describes a royal figure in the Americas listening to a book in hopes it would talk. Here, the royal figure is not someone Kuguano encountered personally, but rather Atahualpa, the last emperor of the Incas. While condemning the injustices of the European colonization of the Americas, Kuguano tells how Atahualpa angered the Spaniards by disdainfully throwing to the ground a liturgical book that refused to speak. And there's more. A friend and collaborator of Kuguano, named Olauda Equiano, was the 18th century's most critically and commercially successful black author. If Gronioso's narrative was something of a first, then the 1789 publication of The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Alauda Equiano represents a high point, recognized ever since as a particularly masterful and influential instance of the slave narrative genre. 
Equiano too writes of being a young boy, enslaved and stolen from West Africa, putting his ear to a book, to hear it talk and being very much concerned when it said nothing. What can we conclude from these parallel scenes, apart from the fact that 18th century people were crying out for the invention of the audiobook? Well, Gates, for one, considers what he calls the trope of the talking book to be a significant feature of black writing in the 18th century, and he finds it in at least one 19th century text, The Life, History, and Unparalleled Sufferings of John Jay, the African Preacher, published in 1811. It shows, firstly, that we have here a literary tradition with authors intentionally repeating and revising each other's imagery, a process Gates calls signifying. But the trope is more than a sign of literary influence, it is a reflection on literature and literacy. These works by black authors, most of whom were formerly enslaved, offer us rare glimpses into the inner lives of people of the African diaspora, most of whom were not merely unable to read and write, but forcibly kept in this condition. The image of a book that must have something to say but refuses to speak is remarkably apt to capture the condition of ignorance systematically enforced upon enslaved Africans. Against this background, the creation of literature by black authors is little short of miraculous. These authors made books talk, telling their own stories, expressing their feelings, and articulating their philosophical thoughts. We should note, however, that illiteracy in European languages, even when enforced by law, did not always mean complete illiteracy. Thanks to our earlier coverage of Islam in Africa, you won't be surprised to hear that many enslaved Africans were literate in Arabic. It is difficult to say how many Africans brought to the Americas in the transatlantic slave trade were Muslim, though one scholar has suggested that the number could be as high as 3 million. Not all of these enslaved Muslims would have been literate, of course, but estimates of the literacy rate in Muslim West Africa suggest that Muslims enslaved in the Americas would, ironically, have had a higher rate of literacy than that found among their white slaveholders. Some of these literate, enslaved people produced slave narratives. A forerunner of Gronioso's contribution to the genre was an account of the life of a literate Fulani man known as Job ben Solomon, who came from what is now Senegal and was brought as a slave to Maryland. In 1734, almost 40 years before Gronioso's narrative was published, Job's life story was published by his friend Thomas Blewett, who had accompanied him to England after Job was freed and who helped to make possible his passage back to Africa. Though one might thus think of Blewett as the author and biographer, whereas in the case of Gronioso we have a first-person narrative, albeit one dictated to someone else, at least one scholar has been willing to proclaim Job a father of African-American literature. Looking ahead to the 19th century, we have at least two cases in which enslaved Muslim Africans wrote their own autobiographies in Arabic, Omar ibn Said, who wrote the story of his life while still enslaved in North Carolina in 1831, and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, who wrote his life story in Jamaica in 1834. Another enslaved Muslim in Jamaica, named Muhammad Kaaba, with whom as-Siddiq corresponded, used the pages of a Baptist Missionary Society notebook to write his Kitab al-Salat, a treatise on prayer. If we add this to the philosophical material by Muslims that we have discussed in previous episodes, the study of philosophy in the Islamic world turns out to take us not only to places like Cairo and Cordoba, but also Sokoto and the Caribbean. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, for now we want to stay in the 18th century, focusing on the philosophical dimensions of black writing in English. While the 16th century gave us Juan Latino, and while there were important fictional representations of black authorship in the 17th century, such as Afra Bain's famous 1688 novel Oro Noco, it is really in this period that we have a critical mass of writing by black authors in European languages. Furthermore, despite the examples of Francis Williams, whom we briefly discussed in episode 29, and Anton Wilhelm Amo and Jacobus Capitain, who we discussed at length in episode 30, most writing by black authors in a European language in the 18th century was not in Latin, but rather in the language you're hearing right now, English. Not counting more ambiguous cases, like that of Job ben Solomon, the first work of prose published in English by a black author was A Narrative of the Uncommon Sufferings and Surprising Deliverance of Britain Hammond, a Negro Man, published in 1760. It tells the story of a black man from New England who is shipwrecked off the coast of southern Florida, captured by Native Americans, and liberated by a Spanish ship 
only to experience a long period of imprisonment in Cuba, and then more adventure after escaping that island. Disconcertingly, the story culminates in his happy reunion in England with a man he refers to as his master. But was Hammond a slave to this master, or was he a servant, using the word master interchangeably with employer? Scholars are divided on this point. Even if he was a slave, though, the narrative is not really about slavery, fitting instead into a popular genre of the time, captivity narratives, amongst which stories of capture by Native Americans were particularly common. Tales in this genre are notorious for mixing fact with fiction, and Hammond's account of his captivity may be at least partially fabricated. The resulting narrative is perhaps more symbolic of the cultural power of depictions of Native Americans as savages than of anything unique to the black experience. Having said that, Hammond closes his narrative by asserting that his adventures must be interpreted as evidence of God's providential care, for he was, as he puts it, most grievously afflicted, and yet, through the divine goodness, as miraculously preserved. As we'll be seeing, this theme of divine providence will be characteristic of other early Africana literature in English. Indeed, this invocation of providence brings us back to Groniosa, whose narrative is far more philosophical than is typically appreciated. He represents his childhood as unhappy because he had a curious turn of mind and sought answers to questions that struck his family members as pointless. He was especially curious about what superior power might lie beyond the sun, moon, and stars, which he says were worshipped by his people. When he asked his mother how that people came to be, she began to speak of past generations. But Groniosa insisted that his question was, who made the first man? This is puzzling. Groniosa seems to be suggesting that the idea of a transcendent deity was foreign to his people, yet he tells us that he comes from Bornu, and the Kanem Bornu Empire in West Africa was predominantly Muslim. Even if he belonged to a non-Muslim people in the area, it seems odd that he should grow up unaware of monotheism. Equally surprising, and for the same reason, is his supposed unfamiliarity with books. Even an illiterate person from this area would presumably have known about the Quran. But if the narrative is historically unconvincing, there is a clear philosophical purpose afoot. Gronyosa's youthful fixation on the idea of a transcendent being is the first step in a process of pursuing divine truth, a process facilitated by God's providential ordering of events. Later on in the narrative, while a slave in New York to a Dutch preacher, Gronyosa has a mystical experience that assures him of his soul's salvation. Even in his enslavement, he says, I would not have changed situations or been anyone but myself for the whole world. I blessed God for my poverty, that I had no worldly riches or grandeur to draw my heart from him. Again, we may find this disconcerting. Why does he focus on the glory of conversion instead of the ills of slavery? Especially alarming is the seeming implication that it was, on balance, a good thing that he had been enslaved. As this already begins to show, slave narratives, especially those of the 18th century, are more complicated intellectual affairs than one might have thought. These usually Christian authors had to reconcile their brutal experiences of slavery with their understanding of God as a benign sovereign. The classic philosophical question of theodicy, how to justify belief in an all-powerful, all-knowing, and loving God, given the existence of evil in the world, is naturally raised again and again by the work of black writers of this era. One might also be critical of Gronyasa's attitude towards his African heritage. Gates draws attention to a passage in which Groniosa says he was happy that the captain of the slave ship removed the golden rings he wore around his neck, arms, and legs. For Gates, this displays a willingness to be rid of his African culture. Together with the lament about being black in the passage on the talking book, Gates infers that the narrative as a whole describes a process of assimilation, a symbolic if not physical, passage from black man to white. But it's hard to square this with the way Groniosa is repeatedly disappointed by the behavior of white people, many of whom take advantage of him following his emancipation. It is also, at least for the modern reader, a bit more comic than tragic that Groniosa tells us how his admiration for classic English works on Christianity led him to imagine England as a place full of holy people. So he was quite shocked when he arrived there and hears people using, heaven forbid, foul language. The main theme of Groniosa's narrative would seem to be that, 
with all the discomforts, hardships, and iniquities that one can encounter everywhere, from Africa to North America to Europe, we are ultimately homeless pilgrims while on earth, awaiting arrival in our heavenly home for true rest and delivery from evil. Let's now rewind for a moment to 1760. That year gave us not only Britton Hammond's narrative, but also a poem published on Christmas Day called An Evening Thought, subtitled Salvation by Christ with Penitential Cries. The author was identified as Jupiter Hammond, a Negro belonging to Mr. Lloyd of Queen's Village on Long Island. We have no reason to think Jupiter was related to Britain, despite the coincidence of two pioneering black authors in English writing in 1760, both named Hammond. Jupiter was already 49 years old when he published his Evening Thought, in which he gives thanks for salvation and exhorts all nations to come to Jesus. By September of 1786, shortly before his 75th birthday, he produced the last of his well-known writings, which was not a poem but a kind of speech or open letter, entitled An Address to the Negroes in the State of New York. Jupiter wrote this address while still enslaved. Yet again, we are liable to be surprised and disconcerted by his frank statement that, for my own part, I do not wish to be free. Yet just before this, he has acknowledged that liberty is a great thing and worth seeking for if we can get it honestly and by our good conduct prevail on our masters to set us free. Nevertheless, according to Jupiter, freedom from the legal status of slave should not be anyone's first priority. As he puts it, getting our liberty in this world is nothing to our having the liberty of the children of God. Earlier in the address, he relies on the instructions of Paul in Ephesians 6, 5-8 to support his claim that, whether it is right and lawful in the sight of God for them to make slave of us or not, I am certain that while we are slaves, it is our duty to obey our masters in all their lawful commands. What should we make of this apparent capitulation to the power of slavery? Well, for one thing, we should always be on the lookout for as yet undiscovered texts. In October of 2011, a graduate student came across the manuscript of an unpublished poem by Jupiter entitled An Essay on Slavery with Submission to Divine Providence Knowing that God Rules Over All Things. It is dated November 1786, and was thus written very close to the time of his address. Whereas Jupiter declines to weigh in on whether slavery in itself is wrong in the address, he is much less reticent in the poem, writing, Dark and dismal was the day when slavery began, all humble thoughts were put away, then slaves were made by man. This poem makes crystal clear that, for Jupiter, slavery is in itself an abomination, but he sees no contradiction between this condemnation of slavery and the discouragement of preoccupation with obtaining legal freedom in the address. Indeed, the very next stanza of An Essay on Slavery says, When God doth please for to permit that slavery should be, it is our duty to submit till Christ shall make us free. Certainly there are nuances here that are difficult to understand, as Jupiter is clear that there is no duty for a slave to obey commands that would contravene God's laws. Why, we might wonder, doesn't slavery itself constitute such a trespass against divine law? Perhaps Jupiter's point is simply that we should patiently suffer the sins committed by others while being careful never to sin ourselves. And another aspect of Jupiter's address ought to be viewed more sympathetically than it has been. When he rejects freedom as his own personal goal, he explains by saying, Many of us who are grown-up slaves and have always had masters to take care of us should hardly know how to take care of ourselves and it may be more for our own comfort to remain as we are. The sense of helplessness may strike us as distasteful, but then an elderly person, like Jupiter was when he wrote these words, could justifiably worry about who and what he would be able to depend on if liberated. What justice would lie in being left free, but at the same time old, frail, and destitute? Jupiter was then clear-eyed about the wickedness of slavery, but no less clear-eyed about the real challenges that would still face those who escaped its clutches. One more work of Jupiter Hammond worth mentioning is his 1778 poem, An Address to Miss Phyllis Wheatley. We mentioned that Equiano's 1789 interesting narrative made him the most critically and commercially successful of black writers of the 18th century, but rivaling and perhaps besting him for fame would be Phyllis Wheatley, whose collection of poems was published in London in 1773. Jupiter's poem celebrates Wheatley's Christian faith and encourages her to cling to it 
presenting us with a powerful early example of African-American literature as a communal conversation, as opposed to the use of literature to prove to white people that black people are humans too. It's also worth pausing over the fact that Jupiter, living in New York, was reading the work of a fellow black poet who lived in Boston, but who saw her work published in England. This is a reminder, if one were needed, that these authors lived in a time when American history was but one part of the history of the British Empire. The Empire provided the political context for all the works we've discussed in this episode, whether published in England, as with the books of Groniasa and Wheatley, or in the American colonies, as in the case of the two Hammonds. This is directly relevant to understanding the development of black writing in English in the 18th century. Our authors were sometimes American patriots. That would apply to Wheatley, for instance, and another important writer of this time, Lemuel Haynes, fought in the Revolutionary War on the American side. But they were just as liable to be British loyalists, persuaded by British promises of freedom to slaves who joined their side of the conflict. When the war ended in victory for the Americans, those freed people who had joined the side of the British had to be evacuated. The greatest number were sent to the colony of Nova Scotia, which is today a province of Canada, and incidentally where Chike lives. Two more authors of autobiographical works from the 18th century, David George and Boston King, their names almost too good to be true given that the British monarch at the time of the American Revolution was King George, were black loyalists who became leading preachers among black Nova Scotians. This is also the right time to come back to John Marent. The full title of his aforementioned 1785 book is A Narrative of the Lord's Wonderful Dealings with John Marent, a Black, Now Going to Preach the Gospel in Nova Scotia, Born in New York in North America. The narrative tells of how he was born free in New York, brought up in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina, and then experienced a religious conversion as a teenager that led to him leaving home and eventually being captured and almost executed by Cherokees. This is, therefore, like Britton Hammond's book, a captivity narrative. Less familiar is the twist in the tale. Marant triumphantly converted his captors and lived for a while among them and other indigenous peoples before returning home. At some point during the Revolutionary War, he was pressed into the service of the Royal Navy. Upon being discharged, he lived in London and was eventually ordained as a minister in the Methodist Church organized by Selina Hastings, the Countess of Huntingdon. The Countess is central in the story of black writing during this time, as she was also a patron of Groniosa, Wheatley, and Equiano. In any case, as the title of Marant's narrative suggests, by the time it was published, he knew he wanted to answer the call of his brother, who had been evacuated to Nova Scotia, to go there and preach. We know much about how that went, because he published his journal from during his time there. This provides us, as we close this episode, with one final example of the variety of kinds of writing published by black authors of the 18th century, and also of how philosophical concerns come across in these works. The form of Methodism to which Marant adhered was Calvinist, which means, among other things, strong belief in predestination, the doctrine according to which the salvation of some and not others has been predetermined by God. By contrast, the Methodism of John Wesley, followed by his fellow autobiographer, Boston King, was Arminian, which meant rejecting the doctrine of predestination as incompatible with free will. Marant describes in his journal how Wesleyan Methodists opposed his ministry, inflaming the community against him by saying that he preached that there was no repentance this side the grave. He writes of his victory over such sabotage, saying, Some cried one thing and some another, but God overruled all things for his glory, and I was permitted to preach in the Arminian meeting, because there was no other in the place, to a very large congregation. Here he boasts that the Arminians failed to stop him precisely because, for all their fervent belief in human free will, they could not change the course of events that God had in fact preordained. Determinists always win in the end, at least when God wants them to. It's another illustration of the centrality of the concept of providence in 18th century black thought, and not the last one we'll be seeing. To the contrary, we can already foresee further discussion of providence next time, when we'll be exploring the brilliance and controversial nature of Phyllis Wheatley's poetry. It's no joke that it would be downright tragic if you didn't join us for that next time on the History of Africana Philosophy. I'm gonna tell him I had heart trials.